Hello. In this chapter, uh, I'm hosting one of the outstanding Turkish designer, Defne Kos. I'm connecting to United States. Hello, Defne. Hello. Hello. How are you? Thank you so much uh, uh, to join our uh, series. My and, pleasure. And now the time. Uh, our PhD student asking to uh, Defne Hanım uh, some questions about design issues uh, relating to their own topic. Let's start. I felt really interesting, interested in your tea design glass that you have worked on with Lipton. I, found that I find the idea of designing a straightforward product or a very common everyday experience very inspiring. Uh, you don't invent something from the beginning, but you bravely attempt to change or shape these very ordinary everyday experiences, such as drinking tea. So based on your experience uh, with Lipton, how would you describe your process of engaging with such elementary everyday experiencing and designing for them? Well, thank you for the question. Um, actually, the collection of tea glasses and teapots that I designed for Lipton are are actually perfect examples of my work related to heritage. So for me, heritage is about understanding and respecting um, people's cultures and behaviors. And at the same time, proposing a new vision, a new language for the future. So no, it is not a nostalgia for the past. Um, therefore, I, I, I make a big, important distinct, distinction between uh, respecting my roots and having a nostalgia of the past. Um, of course, I'm aware of my roots. Actually, I'm very intrigued by, um, intrigued by, by uh, having both Turkish roots because where I was born and I grew up over there and the Italian roots because um, because I, I learned design over there. So it is as important as uh, being Turkish to me for my profession. But in every case, I don't want anything nostalgic or, or vernacular in my design. So I, I, I believe our profession, our job is to envision the future and um, to build uh, what people will need and desire in next years. So it's not to repeat the past forever. So that's why actually I loved working on uh, a very important project for me because it was a cultural icon. And at the same time, it was as difficult uh, as you can imagine because it is over there. It is very important, but um, what actually I, I was inspired by the tradition of the drinking tea by the strong I mean you know we are all Turkish so we that it, there's this strong culture of uh, tea in Turkey and it's not only about the drink itself but it is mostly about the um, social connections and the rituals of people uh, the offering the tea, uh, serving the tea, uh, sipping together the tea, and I mean, drinking it everywhere in the tea house, in, at home, at office, with friends, at the entrance of the parking lot, everywhere. And that is the heritage that actually inspired me. And the behaviors, the, the, the social engagement. So, um, my design for these glasses are not necessarily the, um, copy the, the forms of the past. But it um, respects the traditional gesture. So, so you will keep the, the glass from the upper part and then you, know, you, you drink. And, and that, that's very important. So the, the traditional gestures and the social norms, but with the uh, image of the Turkey of the future, not the past. It's a, it is, um, I can say it's a contemporary aesthetic for that ritual. Uh, so this is what I did with that project. 
And actually that is the approach I use every time I face uh, this type of products. I would like to ask you a more general question. Uh, as a product designer, you create works in variety of fields. You work with many different materials and many different contexts. Just like you explained with the tea glass, there are different usage scenarios and like spirits in the products. So I really wonder how do you accustom yourself to each of these individual cases, each of these individual materials and challenges? And how do you further enhance yourself after each of these different designs, like integrating their different aspects to your future self? As a designer, you are like always getting better and better and uh, learning new stuff. That, that is the actually nicest part of our profession, I have to say. But let's go back to what I was mentioning before, the, the my roots and my Italian roots. Um, there I learned a lot. And I have to mention uh, Ernesto Nathan Rogers, the, I don't know if you know him, but he was the founder of the BPPR. It's, uh, it was, um, one of the most famous architectural offices um, in the 50s, 60s. And he said in the slogan, uh, dal cucchiaio alla città, which means from spoon to the city. And, um, and again, that was in the 50s. The, that means the design method is actually common in small objects as well as in the design of a city. So the only thing that changed is the scale. So that, I, to, to me, the slogan shows the breadth of and the, and the common aspects of design in, in modern understanding. And this determines um, the point of view of Italian design where where designers were trained as architects and, as I was saying, always um, embraced all scales. So um, since I received this training, both uh, physically and spiritually, uh, it is very normal for me to work in many different fields. And regardless the um, type of the product or let's say the product range, the, my approach to the project is always the same. The important thing for me is how people use these products and how they associate with them, whatever they use, how do they associate with them? And this makes me uh, possible to design anything that a person uses. I'm actually, my job is um, to observe people. I, I study people. Uh, to me, the job starts there. Actually, in these days of the you know, uh, COVID days, I was suffering <laughs> for that a lot because I really love to observe people and um, what they do, how they do, how he, she sits, you know, gets up, how drinks water, how he holds the glass, uh, if the water is cold or hot, how to wash his hands, how to go to the toilet. I mean, um, even how do they read a book? How, with, with which type of the light they, uh, they read the book and how do they turn on the light with, uh, you know, the, 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 the button of the light. So, for me, the most important thing is the examine, examining the, uh, the relation and the communication uh, of the people with the, with the products they use. This is my job. So, and then, I mean, after examining, I, I build practically the world around people and design the products and behaviors in their, in their environment. So everyday behaviors are very important. So as a designer, what I have to do is to bring innovative approaches to the culture of use without uh, completely breaking the, these habits that they, they used to have 
without breaking these um, behaviors from people. Although, I mean, all the products that I, I have designed, they might not look, or let's say they, they, they might look like the usual ones. I mean, uh, it, it is still a cup, but um, uh, I should make them feel the difference. I should make them feel the innovative part that I used in that either as a material or as the use. At the end, I should make them feel the excitement because there is one thing that I am passionate about is to activate the senses in the user. So this is like the general way of how I see, even if there are quite big variety of the products, uh, this is how I see and, and then I develop. Household items, furniture, packages, technological products, vehicles, mobile applications. You have been designing products for different industries throughout your career. At this point, what do you think about how designing products in various segments feed each design process? How do the information and experiences gained from different product design benefits when designing a product for a completely different industry? So um, uh, there are a little bit of the similarities with the question before. It's actually very good in this way. We can talk about it a little more. Um, well, first of all, I am personally against uh, specialization uh, as you might have actually understood looking at our <laughs> our diversity of the products we design in our studio and again that is very Italian way of seeing design where designers are trained uh, to to work in different scales and in my opinion that really <laughs> works great because our specialization uh, uh, the, the core of our job is, to me, understanding humans and the, the building, the spaces, object experiences at any scale around, around them and with any materials. So uh, the way I, I, um, I like the most uh, to work uh, when I can do many um, many different products that belong to one large landscape. This is where, um, I will make an example for that, but th this is where the cross fertilization between the, um, between the be between projects works, works best. Uh, for example, we, um, many, product, pro many products and concepts that I designed for different clients are actually part of one environment, let's say, the future of work. Um, so when I work in a topic like that, the future of work, um, I think first of all, at a vision of how people will work in the future. So once I have that clear in my mind, design and designing uh, single products as single pieces of this vision, is becoming more easy and more interesting. So for example, I mean, when you, when I imagine the, the working place where there are no, no more offices, but no more cubicles, no more desks, uh, no more hierarchies, no more nine to five hours, uh, even there are no more open spaces. So we imagine a workplace with a very domestic atmosphere, a stronger combination, integration uh, between professional and personal life. So from there, we imagined more concrete details of that atmosphere, which like the materials, uh, which colors that I'm going to choose, which light, uh, how people are sitting, how people are having conversations and standing, sitting, uh, walking, uh, slouching. Uh, so once you have 
that vision more concrete, it becomes more fluid, more natural to me to design products of all types, like like chairs, like sofas, like desks, like like computers, like user user interfaces, applications, and so on. So, um, and all of these products will be different from previous chairs, tables, uh, because they are part of that landscape that I have uh, as a vision. So if I think what we have done recently, um, we designed uh, you know, this sofas to work while slouching and half transparent, flexible, movable walls, um, lamps that are not anymore lamps, but they are, um, they are surfaces that are lit and small tables to work with your laptops and uh, with your tablets. Uh, very, um, let's say, um, intimate private cocoons to do the hot desking in, in privacy while you are in, still in a kind of open space. Um, modular seating systems that you can use like bricks to build for different or let's say on-demand collaborative uh, spaces, armchairs to relax and um, uh, relax and work at the same time, uh, movable stands that are uh, for large interactive scene screens. Um, uh, well, uh, like the photo boots, uh, the photo phone boots of uh, for Zoom in privacy. So uh, specialization it comes at a secondary level. I can say I mean, it is like learning to use different materials to build that environment. And today, in most of the cases, in many cases these materials are not the material like you know the wood and plastics but they are pixels and menus and databases so with the same concept with the same type of visualization we have done other other projects like the uh, the food the the future of food uh, which is the which is a vision of the uh, future of nutrition that included the design of kitchen appliances using innovative technologies. And then we design the food and the food distribution. So practically as like the design of the nutrition experience as a whole, or we did the same similar uh, for the future of the city, the, the, the infrastructure, the vehicles, as you were mentioning, the, the charging stations, the urban furniture. So it is all about being, being first of all curious and interested about future, what ways of living as well as um, the future technologies, of course. I mean, it's about putting people first and helping them imagining the objects and uh, experiences and uh, spaces that they would have never imagined. It's about creating a future that is exciting, that is new, that is human. Uh, the field of product design, as you have mentioned, is constantly evolving uh, because it's the medium that bridges society, technology, and materials. Uh, these days, while we see slow production and using less as becoming more prominent, we are also witnessing the surge of technology and their inter integration uh, into everyday objects. Uh, so I'm wondering about your take on this shifts in the design discipline. Uh, where do you think the future of design is headed uh, versus how do you think it should be? So, um... I would like to start with a clarification. That is the um, people today think that the technology refers just to new digital technology like smartphones, computers, apps, artificial intelligence, which is 
true. I mean, yes, uh, this is the technology of today, but we need to remember that the term of the term technology uh, defines any tool that humans design to transform nature. So which means that the job of designers has always been 100% strictly connected to technology. And uh, for a designer, technology um, has always been one of the definitely main inspirations. And um, well, to be clear, actually the use of technology, not necessarily the love for technology has always been there for uh, designers and it has always been very important. We used, uh, we always used uh, technology to, to shape the world. And even when we deal with uh, physical products and traditional materials. So, and uh, today dealing with uh, technologies in the material world gets more and more interesting, of course. And um, I, I would like to give actually a few examples for that, which is um, you cannot even imagine how sophisticated, I'm sure you might know, but it, imagine this, how sophisticated is wood today. And uh, there are like companies uh, like Alpi. Alpi is one of the uh, Italian companies that they, um, they take uh, real wood from, you know, from the trees and they slice it and then make into veneer. So then they, re they recompose it by shaping it into the grain of an artificial tree. So it is a little difficult to explain without showing any images, but the, the moral of the story is that today there is a lot of technology, even into traditional materials. So that, that raises the issue of, um, what is really natural today? How do designers use um, how do designers use technology to reflect on the uh, relationship between the natural and artificial? Um, so, for instance, last year we designed for a Turkish company, uh, Agete, uh, that they are manufacturing the flooring systems. They use a material more resistant than wood. And usually they dress the material like fake wood. So uh, I really don't like the fake wood. Uh, I don't think we should, we should remind the look of, you know, natural materials just for nostalgia. Um, but on the other hand, I do understand that people would like to have um, the warmth of the wood, uh, the richness of the organic texture, uh, because it has that texture. So what we did um, to design this new material, we wrote a program on the computer to design a wood from a tree that doesn't exist. Uh, because we generated its grain with a parametric program. So we generated an artificial grain that looks like a natural product or of a nature that doesn't exist. Actually, it's in the studio, we were always teasing each other and saying, oh, this, this was the wood from a tree from Mars. And yeah, the results actually look really like that, a wood from a different nature that is an um, artificial design language that is even nicer than a natural one. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if it is clear to you, but <laughs> this is how I see uh, the, the relationship between the 
technology and the, the products. And uh, actually, I have more examples, but let's let's go forward with the further ones. Definitely, I have a last, I have a last question to you. Designers who have reached a, a certain level are also aware that they have a risk repeating themselves because they have caught a certain style. What precautions do you take for yourself to avoid such a risk? Well, um, actually, I think in our previous discussions, uh, I think it's already answered at least in a part to this question, but actually um, uh, it's a very good question anyways. Um, well, first of all, being engaged in very different projects helps not to repeat myself um, because designers do risk to repeat themselves with the same shapes, with the same solutions, even actually if the projects are very different. So that's why actually your question is, is very good. Um, so one way to avoid this is to, to make a difference between a style and a language. I believe this is very important. This is, this is also probably has been debated among the designers, but it should be also interesting also for other disciplines. Uh, for me, a style is something superficial. It is defined by a few uh, shapes or a few elements. And if the designer adopts that, uh, that style, risk, uh, risks, of course, repeating themselves because their vocabulary may, may be very limited, may be very shallow. Uh, Defining a style is good for, you know, uh, for popular magazines or blogs where, <laughs> where they think that if it is, let's say, white and simple, it is minimal, or uh, if, if they are colorful, let's say it is decorative, or if it has metal and glass, it becomes modernist. And so if, if a designer begins to express in this way, Yes, you are. Um, you become very limited, and you have a bigger risk of repeating yourself. On the other side, a language is something more complex, more rich. It is not defined only by shapes or some choice of materials or colors, but it is based on a way of telling ideas. Um, a certain set of ideas on more complex atmospheres, um, selecting the um, right story for each project. So, in so for myself, in order to avoid repeating myself, I tried in my career to to develop a, a unique language, uh, articulated enough original, recognizable, and uh, distinctive, but never repetitive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Defne Hanım, uh, in this chapter, we hosted award-winning, outstanding Turkish designer, Defne Koz. Thank have you. A good, have a good day from Istanbul Koç University, Istanbul Studio. My pleasure. Very nice to meet you all. And thank you for your beautiful questions, though. <laughs>